Well, hi, everyone. This is our welcome to Talk with Tanner. This is our first live Talk with Tanner. Hi, Gary. Good morning, Tanner. <laughs> Thanks for be, joining me. <laughs> good, to be, good to be here. Good so, to see uh, you again. So we got Gary Chapman uh, here with us today. Um, so, uh, Gary, I, 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 I tell uh, everybody that you're my uh, fish farming master Jedi. <laughs> so, because you know, because I would wish that Star Wars was real, and it's not. But yeah. uh, uh, so, I'd like to kind of open up with uh, your high-level background and right. and uh, you know history. Great, great, no problem. Well, uh, I've been involved in this aquaculture industry, as you know, since 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, after finishing my, my uh, degree at Guelph, I was uh, hired by the nutrition fish nutrition department where I spent five years working with the rainbow trout producers in Ontario to work on diets to minimize in phosphorus and you know, just improving the diets for the industry. After that, I went to the government for four or five years, uh, building hatcheries and, and working in the government hatcheries, uh, specifically the Chinook salmon, coho salmon farm, where we would raise a million salmon every year and, and stock them into the Great Lakes for the sport fishing. And then in 1988, I got the opportunity to, to go into the private sector. Mm -hmm. So from 88 till now, I've been in the private sector. Uh, for my first five years, I was involved. I was a general manager at Coldwater Fisheries, which started off as a small hatchery in Coldwater, Ontario. We expanded to cages on Manitoulin Island and then eventually built our own processing plant to be vertically integrated from A right, right through to, to the market. And then in 93, I decided to get into the tilapia industry. And for the last 20 some years I've been growing tilapia. Uh, first, first farm in uh, Canada to, to to grow tilapia commercially, and we uh, have we actually went back to we went right to Egypt to get our broodstock, and we talk about that later. Um, so uh, during that time, I've also been heavily involved in recirculating aquaculture systems. Mm -hmm. And so for the last 25 years, I've been building and operating and recirculating aquaculture systems. I had my own farm for 16 years in in Ontario, as you know. And after closing that farm, I moved my genetics and all my fish down to New Mexico to a tilapia farm there. And I've been just now working on helping people like yourself and other people mm -hmm. build farms, design and build farms. Yeah, and, and we've, uh, you know, I think we've been working together for about four years now, Yeah, a long right? time now. Yeah, yeah. it's about yeah. <laughs> almost half a decade. <laughs> it always sounds better yeah. when you throw a decade in yeah. there. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, so I, I want to I kind of start at ground zero of fish farming right i i i uh, i think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of confusion worldwide uh about fish farming and what is fish farming right. and 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 let's let's kind of let's, let's kind of start there Let, let's talk about just the fish farming industry in general and how you've seen it sure. uh, progress and uh and and also uh we really got to dig into this you know offshore fish farming versus land-based fish right. farming all right okay Basically, I mean, aquaculture, we're, it is a very new industry. You know, it's, you know, I mean, when I started back in 1980, it had only been around maybe 20 years, right? Um, yeah, you know, so in 1960. 60, yeah, I mean, yeah, the 19, the early, in the 60s, early 70s, in Ontario, we started, you know, the, the start of the Ontario trout industry. Yeah. It started with, the, you know, basically with the, some tobacco farmers in southwestern Ontario diversifying, you know, to have a second crop or whatever, right? So they, they were the first first ones in Ontario to kind of do the same thing the guys in Idaho were doing, you know, raising trout in raceways, mm -hmm. using lots of water, just, you know, they had nice clean water so they flow through and grow the trout and they farmed a little co-op and you know, I think at one time there might have been like maybe 20 of them down in the southwestern Ontario. But like all things, it's as the industry grows, there's, there's new technology and you see bigger farms start to develop, just economies of scale. Mm -hmm. So what, what I've seen in the Canadian industry is the, the, the small trout farmers, and then you had people start cage farming. And, okay, and yeah. everybody you know, knows about the big Atlantic salmon farms on the east and the west coast. Yeah. But there's a, a farmer in Ontario, he was actually, I think, the first guy to do cages in the Great Lakes, right? Or coal. Okay, yeah. So, so it's been around a long time, the, the cages. But compared to other agriculture, we're 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 a new yeah. industry, right? Yeah, and cage farming cage farming is, you know, like you said, that you go to you go to one of the lakes, you literally put a cage. Yes, a, a float. Yes, a hanging net, like you, yeah. yeah, right. So you, you know, you're you're taking uh, you know large water bodies. So, you know, you have to look for most important thing is to look for a specific site that's that's suitable, that you know you're not going to have a, an impact right there on the local 
environment. Mm -hmm. So I, I ran a cage farm for five years. So we, we spent a lot of time searching out sites that we knew would have uh, a lot of water flow. So, you know, the, the nutrients or not the, nu the waste feed and that would uh, feed and feces would, would, would be moved away and spread out. Or it would, mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing about in the winter in, the, in Ontario is we have a four or five month period where we don't feed. And so anything that does accumulate under the cage is actually is gone by the, by the uh, spring. Yeah. Now, so, you know, so there's, there, there is a lot of controversy that you're saying about cages yeah. and, and versus land base. Yeah, and, that's, and, and, mo and most people, uh, I, I find in my, in my journey, most people are barely aware that of land-based fish farming. And, and every, everybody is automatically, when you say fish farming, they automatically think large offshore fish farms. Right. And, and mostly, mostly they're thinking about salmon. Atlantic salmon, yeah, sure. Atlantic salmon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 yeah and Ontario, large, large rainbow trout. Yeah. There, there, is, there is a tremendous move now to have land-based, large-scale recirculating aquaculture systems developed. That's right. Um, you know, it's it's again though it's a new, it's very new. Yeah. Um, there's there's so much work being done. There's a tremendous, uh, uh, I guess every every aquaculture conference I go to now, there's like one or two days just totally devoted to you know recirculating aquaculture technology. Yeah, land-based. Yeah, yeah land-based. Um, the the problem right now is it's the it's the the capital costs are so high to enter into it mm -hmm. that that the the you know comparing the op the capital costs of land base versus cage mm -hmm. it's it's still not a profitable business yet mm -hmm. um, right now as we sit here there's a the largest recirculating aquaculture facility ever built is being built in Miami Florida that's right salmon right for Atlantic salmon yep. So this is how, how big? How, how I think is it? What is it? A million tons or something? Or no, it's, it's initially it's going to be uh, ten thousand metric tons. Oh, sorry. Whoops! Yes. I was so, I, a couple yeah. extra zeros there. No, so, it's, <laughs> so like, you know, twenty million, twenty million yeah. pounds. Yeah, twenty million pounds. Okay, right. yeah, yeah. So when you think about it, the Ontario industry is maybe I don't know, fifteen million pounds or whatever total. Yeah. The whole industry, and we're talking about one farm, half yeah. an hour outside of Miami, in yeah. the Everglades, producing twenty million pounds initially. They have much, much bigger plants. Yeah, and this is a Norwegian Norwegian Denmark company. Uh, company. Yeah. Uh, and I was there uh, just a while ago. Uh, they, I was at a conference uh, in in Miami, and they took 200 of us out to mm -hmm. the site. It's the largest construction site I've ever been on. With, yeah. I mean, it's pretty impressive. But 100, you know, the the number they threw around was 150 million U.S. capital for that project. Yeah, versus versus uh, heading out to sea. And uh, dropping some nets, right? And throwing some, uh, yeah. uh, you know, throwing some uh, fries, fries, you know, fingerlings, fingerlings. Smolts, yeah, 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 yeah smolts where, yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 So I mean, this this is uh, it was an eye opener to the industry. I mean, you know, we we do have some farms uh, in in the U.S. or in North America, and Canada, and the U.S. that are, you know, moderate size. Like uh, the one that we help build in Ontario is about four or five hundred metric tons. Mm -hmm. Of tilapia that, and that they they sell to the live niche market in in Toronto mm -hmm. the Asian Asian market. Yep. Uh, there's one one farm in uh, Virginia who's about four million pounds. Uh, Bill Martin's operation. He's mm -hmm. been around for a long time, but again, he's selling into a niche market, right? right? Is that that's ocean? Blue. Blue that's uh, oh boy. Blue Ridge or Blue Ridge? Yes, Blue Ridge. Yeah, 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 Blue Ridge. Yeah, yeah. Blue Ridge, yeah. yeah and he's quite you. a character, and he's, he runs quite an operation. Uh, but he, again, they're selling growing tilapia, and they're selling into the live niche markets. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's, you know, they're getting a much higher price than, than you would get for if you process the tilapia. We couldn't process the tilapia and compete with tilapia coming in from Honduras or Ecuador. No, Just, yeah, yeah, so and that's the difference between a live fish in a tank yes. and a frozen fillet yeah. from, from wherever. Yeah. From, from China. <laughs> from China, or, China yeah. being a lot of the Asian yeah. countries. Yeah, far, yeah they're getting a very, very good price for their live product. Yeah. But what's happened, though, that's, a, that's allowed us to, to develop research systems mm -hmm. and to to learn a lot um there's a, a new magazine that's out now in our industry and it's called ras you know yeah. and and in there yes ras, yeah, ras. Yeah, yeah. and and the very first edition uh they had an, an article by dr michael timmons who is he's my kind of guru he's the guy that yeah. I, everything i i know about recirculation i basically owe to him in yeah. the cornell university yeah, he was your master jedi yeah <laughs> yeah and it was great when i first met him he he needed a, he needed tilapia and I needed technology, right? Yeah. And I went all over the world looking at technology. You know, we went to Norway, we went to Denmark, and then I find out five hours from my home in Toronto is this Dr. Timmons at Cornell University. He's developed a technology, I think, that 
most people use a lot of it, right? You yeah. Know? yeah. And, and, but in this article he wrote, it's about uh, are we stand, do we have a standardized system yet? And we don't yet, right? No. But he came out of the poultry industry. And if you read his article, it's very interesting in that he talks about how when he first got into poultry, you know, they were ra yeah. raising them, you know, free yeah. rent or whatever. And then the next thing, you know, they went indoor. Now, and wouldn't indoor. the chickens drown in the fish tank? <laughs> no, I'm, yeah. I, I'm yeah. sorry. I yeah, no, sorry. you're right. I'm just kidding, folks. I know but, they're not putting the but, chicken But, you know, but his whole point was that, <laughs> that you know, the that, you know, aquaculture is, is a new industry compared to the poultry industry. Yeah. But it's going to, he thinks it's going to follow the same path, that eventually we will have standardized production systems that, you know, that, that are economical to run, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not there yet, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're, we're still in the, it's, it's in a globally emerging industry absolutely, still. And, absolutely. and uh, uh, there's lots of uh, innovation uh, yeah. still, still to come. So, so let's, let's go through um, kind of pros and cons of, you know, cage farming, uh, you know, ocean farming versus land-based farming. I mean, what? obviously there's a $150 million land-based fish farm being built like we said in Miami, by and this isn't this isn't a uh, you know off the cuff idea from this is from a long standing very experienced salmon farming organization in, in, right. in Norway that right. that is now that has been farming in the oceans right. that is now building the biggest salmon farm in the world on land. So obviously we've arrived. The time the time you know the time wow. times have changed. So what are the pros and cons? Why would you do that? Well, that's a that's a loaded question. I, I, you know, I mean, when you walked around that that site, you know, yeah. like I said, it was a, like I've been in the industry since 1980, and I was mm -hmm. I was standing right beside you know Bill Martin from Blue Ridge, and we're looking yeah. around, and we're like, you know, see these cranes, and you know, the biofilters bigger than my whole farm, and, yeah. You know, but um, you know, the, the I guess the 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 thing that they're saying is that that they recognize that the the U.S. market is such an enormous market for mm -hmm. salmon, yeah, and most of it's imported. You That's know, right. There's very few, uh, actually, salmon farms in, in the United yep. States. Um, and there's, they see that, that cost of freight, you know, from, from Norway or from Europe to the U.S., they've got that right away. That's an advantage of your rate next mm -hmm. to the market. So, you know, I mean, how much is that, 50, 60 cents a pound? I don't know. But, but that's their thing. But they're, they're, to me, this is such a major leap from what we, we, we thought was a, the next step. Yeah. We, we thought the next step was, you know, a thousand metric tons or 3000 metric ton farms. Yeah. And we're starting to see a few of those. Right. But this is just taking it like an entire yeah. next step. This is an elephant uh, step. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. And, and so, you know, every, you know, everybody's like in the industry sitting back and waiting like this, this is either going to be really good for the industry or yeah. it could set our, our recirculation uh, aspects back, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about the cage sites, I mean, and I, I'm, we're not maxed out, you know. I mean, like like British Columbia, uh, even in Ontario, there's there's a lot a lot of sites that could still be developed, right? Mm -hmm. But you, you've got conflicts. You've got conflicts with you know First Nation groups in 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 BC. Yeah. Um, same thing in Ontario. So what's happening is there's actually a, quite a move to to work with these communities, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 a lot of them are very supportive. Like up on Manitoulin Island, there's, there are a few First Nation communities that are heavily involved in yeah. aquaculture. Um, but you know, we we still we're still going to need to grow our fish eventually on land. It's, uh, it's uh, just absolutely. it's got to come right. Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. and and the thing right now is the, to me like we're, we're the capital cost is one thing, but it's the operating costs. That's right. Is the major thing. Yeah. But that's where we've had some major advances, I think. Yeah, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll throw in. Uh, I, I mean, there are there are major uh, and ongoing environmental concerns. I, I mean, yeah. I mean these, you know, uh, uh, they're they're there, right? Uh, so I mean, no, no different than uh, large scale chicken, pig, cow farming. Yes, uh, there is a lot of waste that yeah. comes from from these farms uh, in concentrated areas. So so there is that. But 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 even outside of that, I mean, a lot of these companies do a great job controlling that stuff, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, they've been doing it now, you know, since the 1960s. I mean, it, ha it has evolved. Mm -hmm. the, the industry has evolved quite, quite a bit, but I mean, I'll, I'll just interject the, the, uh, environmental, uh, issues that really are out of all fish farmers control, uh, at this time. I mean, plastic, Let's talk about plastic. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is it is well documented at an ongoing basis today that very few ocean-faring sea creatures at all 
do not have plastic in them. I mean, right. mi microplastics are in our seafood because there is an unbelievable amount of plastic out there, and it's just unavoidable. Uh, you, we've got we've got uh, runoff. We've got we've got land-based agriculture runoff right. and sewage runoff, right, on a global scale impacting these offshore so so you know the oceans the the, the ocean currents are, are you know it's like the wind blows right you know right. so so it's next to impossible for these offshore fish farmers to control those things and and, and those are risks right so and and then we uh and then what was it it was uh was it two years ago that that uh large-scale uh salmon farm in chile had a massive, I think they lost like 500 tons or something like that of, of salmon all in one shot. It was a red algae bloom. Do you remember that? Uh, it, not, not the specifics, but yeah. there, there, are, there are, over the, the, the years, decades, there have been mm -hmm. mortalities lost to, to uh, algae blooms and that. And that's, yeah. that's where site selection is so critical, right? Yeah. You know? But you are, at, you are at the whim of you know, Mother Nature, like, mm -hmm. you know, like up in, again, like my, most of my experiences in Ontario, you know, and there's, there's ice, you know, like we freeze in. So, yeah. You know, we you have to be very careful where you where you select it. But um, you know, I, I you know I I I don't think we're ever going to see that. You know, cages aren't going to disappear. There's mm -hmm. going to be always be cage farms, right? Yeah. You know, there's you know you just unless people want to pay fifty dollars a pound mm -hmm. for salmon or something, mm -hmm. it's you know we're going to have we're going to have cage farms. They're not going away. But I think we're we're going to need to develop a lot of land based farms, yeah. right? To to yeah. meet to meet the demand for for salmon or or for all seafood, right? Mm -hmm. um, not again though, not uh, one thing that I, I get, I hear a lot of you know, all these alternative species that we're going to grow. I think we're going to, you know, we're going to have a red fish and a white fish. That's my my view, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, we we we're not going to farm every species profitable, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's just like we just don't farm every wild animal, you know. So we yeah, we, we can have, farm anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can, can but farm can you anything. can you make can you? money out of it? That's right. right. Like, you know, that's I, right. That can you know, I mean, matter. Yeah. Over the years, you know, I've been involved. You know, we've we've tried to grow. Well, we've success we've you know we've done lake sturgeon we've done our yeah. char we've you know we've um, the different salmons and that but when it comes down to it you know in ontario we're a rainbow trout industry right? yeah that's yeah. what we're good so, at so let's let yeah let's go through those so what are the most established fish that are being farmed global globally right now so you said arctic char no no well no uh, atlantic salmon atlantic salmon for sure yeah. right you know i mean rainbow trout i mean yep. rainbow trout's huge in you know countries like 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 in europe there's countries that just blow away our production in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the United States has always had a, a, a concentrated production of trout in Idaho, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's becoming an issue with that water use of that, that system. Um, you know, so, you, yeah, and then, you've, you know, you've got, obviously, you've got tilapia worldwide is huge, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, uh, it's right up there. But even in China, carp, Carp is huge, right? Yeah, it's, carp. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah, yeah. I, th I think carp is number one in the world, isn't <laughs> well, it? Would, yeah. it's, it's kind of carp and then tilapia are the two most farmed fish in in the world. And then yeah, and salmon. Yeah. They're all and right then there. And salmon, yeah, 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 they're all right there, right? All kind you of com competing yeah. for first place. So so let's uh, so on that note, let's 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 uh, let's dig in to tilapia specifically. Okay. So yeah. and and uh, uh, a lot a lot of uh, you know a lot a lot of people are still you know aren't aware of, of tilapia as I eat a lot of it. Well, you know, we, we farm yeah. it yeah, 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 <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I love it. Uh, but, uh, but let, let's talk about that. You know, what, what is, uh, why, why did you get into it originally? I mean, so, so we're talking, we're talking 19, yeah, yeah, 1993, 94, you, you decided to get into tilapia. Why? What, 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 uh, well, how did because, you find out you know, about the fish? Uh, in 1993, 94, my, my partner at the time, when I, when I had left Coldwater, the trout farm, yeah. We, we actually got a grant from Agriculture Canada to develop an aquaponics project in 93, ah. 94. So we, yeah. we got a small grant from, from Ag Agriculture Canada. We had an agreement with the college, Sir Sanford Fleming College, and we, we uh, rented their little greenhouse space they had. And so we built ourselves a little, a little aquaponics system with you know, mm -hmm. some fish tanks below, yeah. and we, we built some, uh, uh, some lettuce uh, raft system up mm -hmm. above, right? And we, and we uh, went looking for some tilapia, and we contacted a few producers in the U.S., and um, to basically I wasn't satisfied with the, with the fish we got, yeah. right? So we started phoning around and talking to people about, you know, the brood stock and genetics they've had in the U.S., and we found out it's very limited stock. Yeah. And so I, one of our phone calls was to this Dr. Douglas Tave, who was at Auburn University and wrote the book on, you know, genetics for hatcheries managers, and he said if he was going to do it, he'd go right back to the source, right back to Africa. 
Oh, so I, so yeah, so so there's their their area of origin is Africa. They're, they're the, Nile, the Nile tilapia, yeah, the the, Nile. The, the, yeah. I think 98 or 99 percent of the tilapia in the world that are growing come from Nile tilapia. So, so in that, Egypt. In Egypt, right? Okay. So, yeah. I said, you know, I said that sounds like a good idea. So, yeah. uh, through the help, <laughs> it's warmer in Egypt. Yeah, yeah. We should go there. This well, was, now was this January in 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 Canada? No, it, was Nove- it was November. It was October. <laughs> oh, so winter was coming. Uh, actually, it was October <laughs> October of 94. Because I remember, because I didn't go. Yeah. That was the, my biggest mistake. Was oh, I actually yeah. hired Dr. Tafe yeah. and uh, Dr. Uh, Don McLeod from Sir Sanford Fleming, yeah. and paid those two guys to go over to Egypt mm-hmm. and come back with a uh, with a source of wild of wild tilapia from the Nile River. So they went right. Okay, so so you hi- you hired these two doctors. Yeah. And, and and one was a geneticist, right? Yes, Dr. Tave. Yeah. Dr. Tave is the geneticist. Yeah, yeah. And and you said, okay, I need I need you guys to go to Egypt, to the Nile, yeah. find some mums and dads. Right, exactly. And because you and need bring them back to Canada. And bring and bring some of these native Egyptian species yeah. of fish, species of fish back yeah. to Canada yeah. so you can farm them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and and, 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 and people I, must we, have thought you were crazy. Well <laughs> no, I well some people, but uh, I at that time I, I had a uh, there's a program in Canada called the uh, Under National Research Council yeah. called IRAP. It's NRC not, IRAP. Shout yeah. out to NRC IRAP. Uh, uh, yeah. 100, 100% <laughs> for the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I approached my, my IRAP contact, Bob Glanfield, back then, and, and he said, that sounds like a great idea. So we did matching dollars, right? So I, okay. then, I had to, then I had to convince my wife that that was worth throwing, you know, $25,000 into whatever. And boom, you know, buy the tickets. And your wife's like, what's yeah. a tilapia? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. So, so these two guys hop on a plane with two coolers and yep. a couple of hockey, coho hockey bags, which I still keep my hockey equipment in the now this day. <laughs> cool. And they went over there with nets. And their plan was they were going to go and go to different areas and, and you know, sane the, the rivers and that, right? Yeah. But when they got there, uh, Dr. Taves, uh, PhD student, was now the head of aquaculture for Egypt. And he suggested that it was a waste of time to go to all these areas because the there's been too many uh, uh, we'll call them mixes of different strains. Yeah. All right. So he said he would go to Lake Nazar, which is in oh. southern Egypt, where in, in, to the Ashwan Dam, which the Russians built, I guess, in the 50s or 60s. Yeah. And Lake Nazar is just you know a big water body. Mm-hmm. So they phoned me and they said we need a couple more thousand dollars to get a flight and go down there. So they went down there. And they, they uh, it was a long story, but they ended up coming back with a tremendous uh, founder stock for us to, to start yeah. our program with. Yeah. Um, it, just, it was just all, just everything kind of lined up that when they got, to, got down there, there was a, there's actually a hatchery that's run by the Egyptian government there. Mm-hmm. And they actually stock fish in the Lake Nasser every year. Yeah. And so they had the commercial fishermen go out and they had collected fish from all over the lake brought them back and put them into these 40 ponds. And when Dr. Tave and Dr. and Don McLeod, who are both geneticists, heard that, they just took 25 fish from each pond, oh, little okay. fingerlings. Yeah. And, you know, that's the start. That was the start of our program. You know? Yeah. So that was the start. That was the start of, of, the pe- of your pedigree, pedigree genetics pre- program. Right, which is, still on, which is still ongoing. Yeah. And unfortunately, after 16 years of running my farm in Canada, yeah. at the college, I closed the farm, but I moved uh, the whole breeding stock and program down to Americulture in New Mexico, yeah. who, who's been running a tilapia farm since we started the same year in 94, mm-hmm. and we've worked together. And so that's where our program is now under the, the care of uh, uh, Damon Seawright, who, who has his PhD in aquaponics. Yeah. From yeah. 20 years ago, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so it all keeps coming back to aquaponics. It I, does. Somehow, it does. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, no, on that side, I, I'd say we were we were way too early yeah. back in '94. Uh, we had a nice little greenhouse. Uh, we had you know a little some yeah. fish and some some nice lettuce, and it looked great. And we sold the lettuce to the students. And but I quickly realized I was I'm a fish farmer. Yeah. I'm not a a greenhouse grower. And at that time, I would go and meet all the big greenhouse operators in southwestern Ontario. And it was obvious that these guys were so far advanced in their their hydroponic systems yeah. and what they were doing that uh, it wasn't the integration was too early, I mm-hmm. think, Ron. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, now I mean we're yeah we're yeah. We're, we're quite a while later, right? Oh yeah, and, it's, uh, it's exciting. And yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and the, the industries but, are now merging together. Um, so, so you're on. Uh, so, so I don't think a lot of people uh, can appreciate how or or or, or have a, an understanding that that uh, there's very few 
uh, pedigree genetics programs uh, yeah. for fish in general, right? You know, like it's not like cow, like cows and chickens and pigs, and we, we we've been we've been running and horses and dogs. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, we're very familiar with with yeah. you know these these uh, you know genetic breeds and 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 you know the the sort of the pedigree right. uh, um, programs that we've had, but but you know again, like if we go back. Like fish farming, genetics have started. We're so early on our on the curve. we're so early on the curve. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the salmon. There's huge salmon uh, genetic programs worldwide, right? Like yeah. In uh, you know Europe and Norway and Scotland and mm-hmm. I- Iceland, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I was just at a meeting last week with the Ontario Aquaculture Group, and you know, we're still talking about the importance of having a uh, an industry g- breeding program, genetics program. Um, you know, so as far as tilapia, still they're still trying to build the standards. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or to yeah, figure out what, you know, what the best fish for Ontario is. Right. And, you know, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. but, um, with tilapia, there are, there are only a few that I know of. Right. And once everybody kind of knows the gift fish that were, were done about the same time ours started. Right. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, like a pedigree breeding program that we can trace right back to the original fish from, from Egypt. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we're. I don't think there's very few. Of, there's there's not yeah. too many of us out there, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and I again, I I I'm not a geneticist, so I I made sure that I work with you know originally with yeah. Dr. Tay, but now I work with Dr. Roger Doyle, mm-hmm. who who has been involved in fish genetics his whole yeah. career, right? Yeah. And and he's the one that really guides us on our our whole you know pedigree breeding yeah. program and who to breed with who, right? So, I'm just so a bio, I just do what he tells me to do. Right? Yeah. So why is it important? Why, why is it important to have a genetics program? What what is what is what does that really mean? Like I think you're on your what eighth generation. Yeah, we're now. On if, our, you could, if you'd explain how it works every yeah, time you do a Well, yeah, like, you know, uh, Dr. Doyle will will take the the biological data and production data we supply him from the previous generation mm-hmm. and then he'll tell us uh, you know, we're we're He'll, he'll give us a matrix of who to breed for the next generation with all the different families we have, right? So and yeah. we, we every one of our fish has a little pit tag in it, yeah. right? From day one, we've done that. So we, you know, he'll say, you know, find, you know, Tanner Stewart in here and, you know, this family. And, <laughs> find, and, and, find the bald fish, right. mix them with the... Right, right, yeah. <laughs> so we, we'll take a single, you know, so we do single family. So we do like yeah. a single pair mating. So we take a specific male from a family with a specific female from another family. Mm-hmm. You know, and then we, we, we breed them in an aquarium. We, at one time, we had like 72 aquariums. Yeah. So we breed them, collect the eggs, incubate the eggs from that single family, and then we grow them right out the whole family. And then, okay. we, and then we do a within family selection at the end, right? So we grow them right out to, to a kilo, and then we take the 10 best males and the 10 best females from that family. Mm-hmm. We pit tag them. We keep all the biological information. We put it in this massive spreadsheet and we send it to dr doyle right okay yeah then, so so by best you're looking for the the best looking the healthiest the ones that grew the biggest is that yeah yeah combination we're you know uh, we're, we're looking for for a few things we're looking for the fish that uh, you know obviously uh, grow the biggest we want but but we also want to have it's a, called a, a, a we want to have a fish that's uh, got the right body shape for fillets. That's what mm-hmm. thing we're looking for is, you know, to increase yeah. fillet yields, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so we, we, we actually do, we, we will take a length and weight of each fish. And just because it's the biggest uh, doesn't mean it's going to make the grade if it's, if it's not, the condition factor isn't right. That's another th- thing that we kind of yeah. measure out. So we, we do, we'll, we'll measure and do the lengths and weights in the entire fem- female population, mm-hmm. the entire male population, and then we'll keep the 10 best. So as we're doing it, we're like storing them in the aquariums until we, we're done. Yep. And then we go back and we go, these are the 10 we, we, we're going to pit tag. Right? Okay. And, yeah. and, and, and there's a lot of, uh, and this is necessary as well because genetic diversity means it's a stronger, uh, you know, less risk of, you know, ailments and diseases in, to maintain genetic, well, genetic yeah, diversity. Yeah, right? and that's where, I mean, it, it all goes back to the original fish we got that you have to have a large genetic base to start with variability or yeah. you know you don't you can't do it so that was so the, the initial thing was we went we collected the fish yeah but after a few years we wanted to do a, a you know a, a bigger genetics program and that's where before we could get irap support for a three-year program yeah we had to verify that we had a, a genetic base that was worth spending all this money on mm-hmm. so that's when dr doyle got involved and he did the dna analysis of our original fish and all that and and compared it to the the other fish that he knew the strains and that right yeah and his conclusion was that we had a definitely a, a pure stock of nilotikus with a very high you know variability or genetic variability right so it was mm-hmm. 
a good candidate for a, an intensive ac, uh, breeding program. Cool. And that's that's important because yeah. I mean you, you don't want to start off like you know we go back. I just don't want to slam the ar Arctic char, but yeah. it came from a very few families, right? Okay. So oh, you, so there's been some, so so there's history of of some fail, foundational failures of genetic programs. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. And so yeah. you got you can, but you know the, the you can go back to to the wild and get new new you genetic have to start material. Over, right, right, right. Yeah. You know, and you know, uh, I, I, we should be a lot further along than we are than eight eight generations, right? And that's yeah. why moving the program to New Mexico, I'm hopefully we can do that because the nice thing about Slab, we should be doing a generation every year. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the fact that we've only done eight is yeah is 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 good and bad. I mean, we we know we still have a lot of. We're going to have a lot more uh, gain. Yeah, like yeah. Every every generation, we're seeing an improvement, yeah. and that's through you know the intensity of our selection process, yeah. and also you know just the fact that uh, uh, you know we 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 started we started with a stock that grows mm -hmm. very big. That's important too, right? That that you know if you in Lake Nazar the fish grow up to seven or eight kilos, right? We've got wow. some fish down in New Mexico that are like easy. You know, for the Americans, fifteen to sixteen pounds, right? You know, and then people say that. Well, we've we've got them. We've, yeah. You know, we we've, we've we've we can produce them even, even uh, bigger, but you can only keep so many pets feed, around. That would feed a few people, but yeah, but right. it's a pet now, right? Yeah, it's a pet now. So <laughs> you don't you don't eat the mama fish. So if you look at if you if you look at our growth curve, uh, you know, a lot of tilapia, tilapia kind of, I wouldn't say that they peter out, but they they kind of hit a wall at maybe a pound and a quarter, pound mm -hmm. and a half, and you know, only kind of their feed conversions and their growth curve kind of like. Levels, levels off. out. Yeah. Whereas with ours, uh, it's like still steep at two yeah. pounds, right? Yeah. It's still steep at four pounds, right? Yeah. And we've had some really good growth trials done by the University of Guelph. Shout out to them that they did yeah. two growth trials for us. And that data, even though it's it's quite old now, but still just showed that, I mean, these things mm -hmm. up to a kilo, our, our strain just keeps keeps growing, yeah. which is important if you want to get into fillets. Because I think we may eventually get into even bigger fish for, you know, bigger fillets. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, right now... You know, yeah. everybody kind of grows them to two pounds or three pounds. Maybe yeah. we grow them bigger. There's, there's more opportunity for different products yeah. to yeah. come out of, out of bigger fish. So, yeah. so that's, that, that's a really good segue into, uh, you know, well, you, you and I, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be building an organic tilapia yep. farm, which, which I could not be more excited about, right, uh, which, which I think is going to be, um, I believe, is going to contribute to the industry as a whole. Uh, but, but one of the reasons I'm so excited to, to, to build our farm out is the sustainability side of, of, of tilapia specifically and land-based fish farming. I mean, you've got a whole another level of, uh, of sustainability when, you, when you've got a land-based recirculating system and you're minimizing, uh, you know, your water input and, mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're taking the, the waste streams from the fish. In our case, we're feeding the nutrient to other plants. Right. But, but let's just talk about the sustainability and, you know, explain what conversion rates are, the sustainability of, like, fish farming in general versus other sources of protein. Oh, boy. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so going back, you know, 1980, yeah. when, I, when I was working in fish nutrition, you know, we, we were so early on, you know, working with, you know, trying to find diets that were uh, just the right proteins and carbohydrates and, you know, mm -hmm. all, all these energy sources and that, and, and there's been such an improvement in, in the, f the feed that we can get now in our industry, right? Mm -hmm. The feed, the feed companies are spending so much money on that over yeah. in, in Europe and mostly like the big companies. Um, so wh what I'm seeing is that, that we're, 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 a lot of work is going into, you know, alternative protein sources rather than just fish meal and, you know, yeah. so, so to feed the fish, to feed the to fish. Feed the, yeah. And, the and, fish to feed. That, and they're, you know, uh, you know, tilapia, you know, they're not a carnivore. I mean, so they're, they, you know, they're a grazer, right? Yeah. So, so we, we can feed them. I mean, they'll grow, they, yeah. they'll grow on a hundred percent plant protein. You know, they don't need fish meal, but we do, they do grow better with a little bit of fish meal, yeah. right? A little more protein, a little yeah. more fat well, in their feed. Just something yeah. about, you know, but, uh, but but there are diets uh, being developed by the feed companies that that will be very suitable for tilapia for recirculating systems mm -hmm. that will be uh, all plant protein or other uh, protein sources. Mm -hmm. um, you know the fat. Uh, a lot of it used to come from fish oil. Now there's a lot of alternative oil supplies that are we're we're, we're putting into our fish feed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but again, no tilapia is that one fish that that you know we we can consistently get a feed conversion of 1.05 to 1.1 1 
Of... What, what, so one point oh five, and, and so so feed conversion uh, is basically the weight of the food you food, the yeah. feed the food you feed the animal mm-hmm. and the weight of edible. Or, yeah. or, or the the, the, no, the, the biomass weight, produced. Yeah. The biomass yeah. produced. Yeah. So it's essentially, so you said 1.05 it, yeah. to 1.1, like it's almost equal. Yeah, it's almost, yeah, right. And, and yeah. you know, a lot of people will, well, wow, that's, you know, it's, it is possible. I mean, the you know, when I first got involved yeah. uh, in the trout industry, we were, you know, 1.6, 1.5 was considered a good conversion, you know. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, the, the, the farmers are getting better conversion. Well, you're paying a lot more for your feed, so you better, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, so, so the feed costs have gone up, right. but the amount of feed in required to get the same weight out has gone way down. For sure. And the yeah. Sam- yeah, the salmon. Yeah, like a lot of, you know, again, slamming the salmon industry, people would say, well, you're feeding this many kilos of salmon to produce this much. Well, yeah, that, that maybe that was, but the diets are so much better now, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, they're, you know, they're slowly reducing the, the, the fish meal input. Um, but again, tilapia to me, you know, it's, it's the one that, you know, it's the winner when you look at sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, If you, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited that, that we're, we're getting some diets now that are specifically designed for recirculating Mm -hmm. systems. Scredding, you know, is one of the companies and they're all, they're all doing it, but they, they seem to have, they're spending a lot of money on this Mm -hmm. specific diets for recirculating systems to keep the feces, you know, like, uh, compact so you can get it out right yeah you know because you know no matter what you do the fish are gonna they're gonna you're gonna they're gonna eat and there's waste yeah 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 so fish poop fish yeah <laughs> and, and 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 you know and, just in case anybody yeah. didn't know no, and, 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 you know and like i said i've been doing this research since 1980 yeah. and i've seen like i call know, i call it nutrients. nutrients fish make nutrients well yeah but that okay that's so but, but that's that, another story no yeah. no but that's the nutrient stream right now that yeah. that that you know most people are just getting out of the system yeah and you know there's where we've got a lot of opportunity to with new technology well it's not new technology but technology that we we separate that out Mm -hmm. we gather it and we can recapture the nutrients that are in that waste right yeah so right now you know the you know the the whole thing we're working on is that you know the you know the fish excrete ammonia and and we we have biofillers that convert it you know to to nitrate and then nitrate which what the plants need well we've always We've always produced that. So for yep. you know, for 16 years, we always maintained our tilapia system that our nitrate would always be about 200 to 300, right? Mm-hmm. You know that, and we, it was acceptable for tilapia, right? So, so, and the way our industry has always maintained or or keep those levels is by adding fresh water. Yeah. So we've always had to add you know a minimum amount of fresh water to to keep that nitrate. Where mm-hmm. it's, it's not too harmful. Yeah, you got to del- you got to add new water into their tanks, yeah. you know, to to keep the uh, yeah to keep the nitrate from building up too right. high. Too that, high, to, right? You got to keep the environment clean. Yeah. You have to keep yeah. a nice clean environment for yeah. these fish to live in. Right? Yeah. yeah. So we, we're you know we're we're very standardized at, at getting solids out. Everybody mm-hmm. that I know uses a drum filler. If they, don't, if they don't use a drum filler on large scale, then they have to have some They're kind of. They have, well, they have to have some kind of system yeah. to get the solids out. And a drum drum filter. Yeah, that's essentially just a filter to take solids out of the water. It's right. Just the water goes through this drum filter. It collects all the solids. Yeah, and, and it's quickly yeah. moved outside. Yeah. And you know we've built farms now where there's actually zero discharge to the environment. Mm-hmm. You still have that that waste leaving the drum filters mm-hmm. that you collect. Yeah. But you can use that. I mean, you can. Yeah. You know, some farmers I know like collect it and they store it over the whole winter and then they they. Usually, they, yeah, they they irrigate their fields. Yeah, if you've got the land, but if you don't have the land, there's technology now that you can, you can actually take that that solid the, the waste. Yeah, add a you know add some polymer or something to bind it, store it, and then use it as a fertilizer. Right. Yeah, I mean and, to me, yeah, it, I look I look at it as another value stream. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is it is the, uh, you, you know, and every and, and lots of people have. Anybody who's gardened or gone shopping in the in the fertilizer area has seen that you know jug of you know fish fish yeah fish know, way, yeah, yeah fish, fish fertilizer yeah. fish fertilizer yeah. fish you know uh, biodegradable yeah. biodegraded fish waste or yeah. or you know you, you know I'm I'm from New Brunswick right so you know there's the continuous there's the long standing history of you know taking lobster shells and and uh, and various different seafood waste uh, streams and and yeah. and tilling it into the soil because it's great sources of nitrate and and I and I think uh, one of, one of the coolest things I love about it uh, which is why I'm so dedicated to aquaponics farming in general and and a lot of people maybe don't realize this but but uh it's impossible uh or you know uh, 
manure from cold-blooded animals, i.e. fish, are not conducive to salmonella or E. coli. Okay. Right? And, and that is a huge... Uh, value add. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a it's it's a little bit less risk, right? right. Versus, uh, you know, we've seen we've seen what's happened here too many times over this last few years, even especially you know with romaine lettuce and and you know the outbreaks, the dole recalls, and all these right. all these recalls of the leafy greens. Actually, a, a lot of the times, and and you know it's been it's been E. coli, right? And and most of the time, not all. I'm not I'm not saying all of the time, but most of the time that would be a choice of fertilizer uh, related issue. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know from mostly warm blooded animals. You know, you would assume cow, pig, Cows, sheep yep. manure, right? Yep. Uh, and and that. And that is a, you know, just more of an inherent risk when you're using those sources of fertilizers versus a, versus a fish manure, right. where that risk is just not there, really, right? Yeah, and you know, and, and you know, and, and I don't know how much you want me to divulge about what we're doing in New Brunswick, but you go right ahead. But uh, but there, you know, there, you know, <laughs> subscribe I mean, to our channel. Yeah. You'll know everything. So so yeah, but you know, there you're going to have a. Um, you're going to have a significant size aquaculture component to yeah. it, right? Yeah. So it's not like a lot of the systems I've seen where, you know, it's like, you know, there's small aquaculture system, mm-hmm. like, you know, four or five tanks where we're going to have yeah. a, a real fish farm there. Yeah. So we're going to 6, have... 6,600 fish a week. Uh, yeah, so we're, yeah, and, and we're going to have, um, you know, uh, a significant amount of, of waste leaving those drum filters. Yeah. And we're going, to, we're going to keep that, and we're going to turn that into a, some kind of product, right? So you're going to, you're going to have mm-hmm. the ability to, to, you know sell it to a, a farmer or, or, or whatever, but it's, we're going to keep it. Now, we, we could even go to a co- total close and retain the water after we dewater that, right? Yeah. Uh, but we're, only, we're in our system now with, with the, the, the integration of the fish with your plants, mm-hmm. boy, we're getting down to like less than two, maybe 2% of the total volume of the aquaculture system a yeah. day, which is like not a lot of water compared to what other aquaculture guys are doing, right? You know. Yeah, because we're going to have the water coming back yeah. off of the plants as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Which yeah. is uh, so it's not a true. You know, a lot of people say, uh, you know, so so our, our our system will be semi closed loop. I li- I like to call it, and you know, I, I think I think closed loop is is an overused term because when when people say closed loop, I think a lot of times the innuendo is there's no input. Right. right? You know, right. it's it's always that you know we have a we're feeding the fish. I that's mean, right. we have an organic input, so that's we right. have to feed the fish. That's input number one. Uh, but then as far as the water goes, I mean, we're feeding water in as well, mm-hmm. but we're getting, or just in general, when you're marrying land-based aquaculture with plant production, we're minimizing, we're, we're getting, we're, we're getting it. I mean, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think that there's any more water sustainable format of farming that, you know, than aquaponics, it's getting, right? Yeah, yeah. It's getting pretty, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's getting pretty down there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even when we were doing just our, our tilapia farm in, in Lindsay, Ontario, mm-hmm. Um, in the winter time, because the cost to heat the greenhouse and whatever, mm-hmm. we would we would go down to like almost like as, as close like maybe one percent of the volume per day, right? Yeah, it was it was very little water, right? Yeah, I mean because we were right in the middle of campus, so we had our farm right in the middle of campus. We, yeah. were, we were only a hundred ton, like, but still a hundred tons, like, you know, still you know, a couple hundred thousand pounds mm-hmm. a year. But we but we were running that on less than a, less than a gallon a minute at, at some times a year, right? Yeah, and yeah. that's amazing, and that yeah. matters. I mean, oh, I yeah. mean especially it, it matters more and more every day. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, we're we're yeah. not uh, we're not heading towards a more abundant world, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, what, you know what what got me excited when I first met you was you know like from running our systems for twenty years we we've got daily records for sixteen years of our our water yeah. quality, right? Yeah. And so you know when when first meeting your people and you know and they. We need a nitrate of this. We go. Well, that's you know the nice thing about tilapia is that that production is year round. Yeah. Versus like other species where you know you've got your ups and downs where you market mm-hmm. them and you get eggs in. And you you know tilapia we're, we can bring them in every week. Yeah. Every month, whatever. So you you have a consistent feed input every day, that's which right. is which is critical. And more than that, it's not just consistent every day. It's consist- consistent during the day. Mm-hmm. It's not like spikes, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, we feed, we feed our tilapia 24 hours a day, like every hour on the hour. Right? And they're a very reliable fish, very, yeah. very reliable. And so you have a reliable nutrient yeah. supply. Yeah. Right? And delicious. You know, you put a little yeah. bit of, you know, fry oh, them yeah. up in a frying pan, a little bit of butter, a little lemon, yeah. lime on them, you know. I, it's yeah. <laughs> so you know, going, just going back, you know, you, you, you made a comment about uh, people not knowing about tilapia. Yeah. But if I go back to when I first got in in 94, yeah. 
I remember going to the Boston Seafood Show, which which we've gone to. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> so I remember the first time I went to the seafood show. You know, there wasn't tilapia anywhere in '94, yeah. like nowhere. You know, and they they you know the first guys that tried to sell it were selling. They called it St. Peter's fish because it is the fish from St. Peter's fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and our, our fish were actually in a movie in Toronto. That's another story about, you know, uh, you know, fishing. You know the. Okay. Feed the masses, right? Because yeah, that's, yeah. that's the fish. So they, yeah. they tried to market the St. Peter's yeah. fish. That didn't go. Then yeah. they okay, it. so yeah, and, and just to clarify, anybody who hasn't read their, their Bible passages recently, St. Peter's fish, it's the story of St. Peter the, on yeah. the mount, right? right. And, feeding the masses, yeah. Yeah, feeding the masses yeah. in, in out of the, uh, the basket that just kept the fish just kept coming out of and he fed the masses it was tilapia That's it was right. tilapia yeah. it's in yeah. in St Peter's fish it's on the back yeah. of many many christians cars yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> That's tilapia folks right so, there so that was the fir- <laughs> first things i saw when they're trying to sell it and then they call it you know cherry tilapia i don't know there's all kinds of names but yeah. but then you, you know we can you know you can thank production out of south america really they developed the 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 live not the live market the fresh fillet market yeah. in the Ecuador US. right Ecuador. Ecuador is one of the well big first ones. Co- yeah. Costa Rica I think might have been the first one okay yeah a big yeah. one rainforest there and I've been to that farm you know twenty thirty million pounds of production yeah. in you know one area um, you know but I've been to farms in Jamaica right yeah uh, the Jama- Jamaica farms were pretty early in but uh, they they just couldn't their cost of production couldn't compete with Costa Rica or Ecuador or Honduras mm-hmm. right uh, so you know uh, you know the next 10 years, all of a sudden, you know, tilapia it was everywhere, right? And then you go to the, the Boston Seafood Show, and there's some real big companies, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, uh, again, though, all, all of the fresh fillets into the U.S. come from Central or South America, right? Yeah. You know, but, you know, now, now, I mean, it's almost on every menu when you go into a restaurant, right? Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and every, and every, and every, you know, truly, you know, Asian, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, not non-Westernized Asian restaurant, like a, tr- a true, uh, you know, authentic Asian yes. restaurant. I mean, in most of them you go into, they have live tilapia. Oh, li- they, oh for they, sure. You can, yeah. you can, you know, choose right out of the tank, you know, yeah. which is nice. And uh, I like going to the uh, you know, TNT markets yeah. here in, yeah. in Edmonton. And, you yeah. know, I think they've got some in Toronto, uh, oh, they in got Ontario lots of, yeah, and, in as Toronto well. Too, and, yeah. uh, um, you know, so my, my kids, my, my kids, you know, so Clark is five and Quinn's uh, three. You know, they're both, he's almost five and she's almost three. Uh, uh, he loves tilapia. Yeah. I've had him. I, d- I didn't know what a tilapia was growing up either. Right? No. Oh, no. in Brunswick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like salmon, trout. That was you know that yeah. that, that was it. And, and uh, uh, you know haddock, a little bit of haddock, and everything. You know, a couple white fish. But but uh, um, you know my 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 son has eaten the whole tilapia. Mm-hmm. You know Asian style. You know yeah. full body. You know <laughs> or, or, eyes are sitting on the plate and everything. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He loves it. Yeah, and, and you know the the. Uh, you know, that's how when I first got into tilapia, it was it was from visiting a store in Toronto one day, right? Yeah. I I went with my 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 ex partner. We were uh, down in, in Chinatown in Toronto, and and we just happened to be there when when they were you know bringing in a load of tilapia from one of the farms in the U.S. You know, and, okay. And, and, so this was right before 1994. That that was the, yeah. that was the moment that yeah. you you were in a you were in a an Asian market. Yeah, we were down there, and and we were actually it was we were doing a uh, consulting job for. For someone that wanted to get into aquaculture, yeah, and we had done a, a species matrix, you know, all these had all these species and uh, different uh, things that criteria that that make it suitable for aquaculture, you know, uh, being you know the eggs, eggs availability, early rearing, nutrition, yeah. all these things, right? And and tilapia kept winning like this matrix, right? And it okay, was, yeah, yeah. Uh, and for and and the market though. Uh, was there for the, for the niche market in Toronto, right? Yeah. So at one time there was actually six of us had little farms in Ontario, right? Oh wow. Yeah. 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 And you know, but uh, again, it's economies of scale. I mean, you got to get you got to get big, right? You can't. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all farming, yeah. right? It's not just yeah. it's not not specialized to fish farming. No, farming is sure. a tough business, and margins are tight, and yeah. people like to pay as little as possible for great food. I mean, that's that, right. or, well, everything, yeah. I guess, right? You know? Yeah. So now you know now we have that a big one in Ontario, the the Sand Plains group. Mm-hmm. They're a big farm, you know. Yeah. So you know, and that's. That's the size you got to be, really, to have automation, right? To have mm-hmm. automatic feeders, to yeah. have you know, uh, fish graders and fish pumps and things like that. Just like you're in, mm-hmm. like the other industry, you know, you, you got to get into this automation, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, when I got when I looked at that tilapia back in, and I saw it in this live market, yeah. and I, I saw these guys unloading. I go, man, I said, we got to be able to do it here. Yeah. And you know, it's going to be like 
10 or 16 hours, not on a truck, right? Like we were, so yeah. we build it. We yeah, were why hour, can't we farm that? Yeah. Why can't we farm yeah. that here? You know, so yeah. back then we couldn't because the, the Ontario uh, government uh, wouldn't allow us. There was only, we were yeah. only allowed to grow four species. So back then our industry, and I was involved, uh, we pushed to have changes made to the, the regulations to allow us to expand the species list. So we went from four species, like we were like rainbow trout, brook trout, and small and largemouth bass. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, we were up to 40 species we were allowed to, to culture in Ontario. Yeah. And at first there was a kind of a, um, I wouldn't call there was like a, uh, a group trying to push that we couldn't grow tilapia, right? Yeah. And so I remember we had a meeting with some biologists and you know I had worked for the government and, and we said, well, if they get in the wild, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to die in Ontario, yeah. right? I mean, like, <laughs> they're not you know, going to Because they're, you know, they're a warm fish, uh, right? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, we didn't cover that. They, no, they're, they, like, yeah. they, they're, they're comfortable at like 22 degrees, right? Or, or 28 20, degrees. 27 to 28 is yeah. The, yeah. probably the best, but you know, they... And yeah. it's fatal at what, 13? Uh, yeah, yeah, you start getting down to 12 or 13, so yeah. you know, like, okay, it's minus 39 out here, or, whatever. <laughs> I don't, or in, even in Ontario, <laughs> yeah. it's minus 13, so yeah. uh, I don't think they're going to... Yeah, but so anyway, there was no real invasive species threat here in Canada, right? Right, know, When it comes to tilapia, yeah. That they're going to get out, you and know. Then, and then to top it off, I think to to, to really we we also in, in in addition to the new species, we actually had a uh, a system where we classified uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. A class uh, I can't remember right now, but there's an F1, F2, F3, or whatever. And so if you had a facility like we built that basically was had no effluent going to public waters, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so. Yeah, nothing's going uh, nothing's, into the public. Yeah, so, nothing's yeah, leaving so, the farm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's not like you're, you know, so you could basically build that kind of facility anywhere, and you don't, you know, you, you don't even need, you know, you don't have to even have a ministry environment permit because you don't have a discharge yeah. to a point source discharge, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing about I think about you know, going back to recirculating this. We we can situate these facilities like in an industrial park, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we were right in the middle of campus. Um, you know, as long as you you. You know, you, you have what I consider like power. I mean, natural gas yeah. to me is a, a a big a big bonus if you have that. And yeah. your you know your infrastructure like your roads and and you, you know you need a good water supply, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, like this is this is no this is why I fell in love with it. I, I mean, you know, you you've spent most of your all of your career dedicated to, the, to this. Uh, I mean, I, I've only I've been at it for over five years five years, now, yeah. and. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, they say timing, right? You know, timing is everything. Um, when, when I was first introduced and I, and I saw my first land-based fish tank and I, and I saw, you know, nutrients being fed to plants, yeah. it was just a no-brainer. I, I, I can almost feel it, you know? It's like, it's like okay, this is, this is going to be, uh, nothing's the end-all, be-all. You know, uh, there's no such thing as a silver bullet in, right. in agriculture uh, uh, is, is one thing I've learned over the last five years. But this is hands down. Land-based fish farming, you know, indoor uh, food production, cannabis production, um, uh, it's all going to be an integral part yeah. of our entire agriculture system going forward forever. I mean, it's here now. It's yeah. not leaving. No, it's not leaving. You know, no, and, far and, from it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not leaving. It's it's just going to spread yeah. worldwide. So so let's 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 go back a little bit. I, I want I want to get I want to kind of go back to Gary Chapman here. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, so it's 1980. <laughs> you're driving what your volkswagen beetle or what were you driving yeah i had a volkswagen <laughs> I, had, I had a volkswagen van yeah, did you I have did. a vw okay yeah, I, that yeah. was a, that was a guess but no, no, yeah. yeah so you had your I VW still have a volkswagen van. Yeah. yeah it had the wolf painted on the side of it your hair was down what how long no, down I, past your <laughs> i did have i did have hair and a beard and uh and uh did a lot of traveling out east with it right yeah I almost yeah. ended up working at a salmon hatchery outside of uh halifax right? okay yeah i mean yeah uh, my buddy well, at, my buddy at the time tried to uh um you know, uh, recruit me to a new hatchery just being built in New Brunswick. Sorry, yeah. Not, not yeah. And uh, but you know, my my uh, my partner, she worked for Ontario Hydro, so we stayed in Ontario, right? Okay, yeah. You know? Well, uh, what, why did you like what drew you to fish farming at all in the first place? What was what was <laughs> okay. that reason? You were just right, well, eating, uh, you know, a, a fried piece of fish one no, day. No, 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 <laughs> no. It's it's even. Uh, I was working in the uh, zoology department for. Uh, a professor there. Okay, uh, yeah. at Guelph. Uh, at yeah. Guelph, yeah. And uh, his name was Dr. Uh, Beamish, Bill Beamish. His family's really well known in the science in, uh, field, yeah. you know. And so uh, on Fridays, we always went up to the factory lounge to play pool. Okay. And have a few beer. And one day we were there, and there's a Dr. John Hilton was there, and I knew him from playing ball hockey against him. And, yeah. you know, and he said he, you know, John was like an up and coming fish nutritionist and just okay. got a big, big, grant to do some work 
and he was working under Dr. Stan, Sl he had done his work under Dr. Stan Slinger, who was one of the first fish nutritionists in Canada. And okay, he came wow. from the poultry industry, right? Yeah. And so the, the three guys, there was Stan Slinger, John Hilton, and Young Cho were the three fish nutritionists in Guelph at the time, world leaders. And John said he had a bunch of money and he was building a, a, a project, uh, some labs in, in the, fish, in the uh, animal poultry, animal nutrition uh, wing. And Beamish said, you should hire this Chapman guy, right? So he said, you want a job fish farming? And I said, what's, f oh no, he said aquaculture. And I go, what's aquaculture, right? <laughs> and he says, fish farming. Because I went through zoology and all his stuff. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so I went home and the next, you know, I didn't have internet back. You know, I couldn't go and look it all up. So <laughs> anyway, I Did just you pull started, your Encyclopedia uh, Britannica? <laughs> exactly, yeah. So I just started reading everything I could about it, right? And, you know, a week later, I started over there and built my first systems yeah. with someone who had actually been working for Young Cho. And we built our first research system back in 1980 yeah. with a gravel drum biofilter, which did everything. Like, you just ran all the water through it, collected the solids, and it did yeah. all the thing. And you had to backwash and clean it out every week it was a mess you know but it was it was my first experience in recirculation right and then that was it just so that, that was just you, you happened upon that in the pool hall essentially exactly and yeah and you know and then from there you know i worked with with uh, dr hilton and dr cho and dr slinger retired but dr cho was the ministry of natural resources uh, fish nutritionist for the ontario government okay. so he worked on all the hatcheries and so he uh, was doing some uh, feed trials at the salmon hatchery. And I had, at that point, I was ready to move on after four or five years. Yeah. And I approached him, and he, next week he got me into the, the, the Ringwood Fish Culture Station, where, I, where it was my first exposure to the, the Ontario government's hatchery system, right? Yeah. So I went there and worked there for a few years. And then I worked at Queen's Park on the development team, capital team, building new hatcheries for the, for the Ontario government. Mm -hmm. So I was involved in uh, two projects, uh, Blue Jay Creek uh, up on Manitoulin Island and the cage farm they had. So at one time they were growing fish for stocking lake trout in, the, in cages. Yeah. So that was my first exposure to cages and I got hooked on it. And then in 1988, I got the opportunity to leave and and go into the private industry, right? Yeah, so, and then you ran your own farm for eight, well, you know. Well, for five for years, I was, for five years, I was general manager of Coldwater Fisheries, which yeah became, you know, about the, it became the second largest farm in Ontario. So I was the first person hired there, walked into an empty building in 88 and built a, we'll call it a very well, uh, historical research system, right? Which, <laughs> which, which, which uh, I, you know, I, I, back, that's way my early days, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I was there for five years. And during that five years, I, I got really involved in other, like just working with the industry. And I actually became the executive director for our industry for a few years and helped push those changes through for the you know, new species list. Mm -hmm. And then I got hooked on tilapia. And, and I'd say the, the best thing that happened, the two things that have been that I go, you know, was the ability to go to Egypt with NRC IRAP's support. Yep. Meeting Dr. Tave, but the second thing was meeting Dr. Michael Timmons at Cornell University, right? Yeah. He, Those he's the two guy that. Your two mentors. Uh, well, more Dr. Dr. Timmons, yeah. 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 Wow. So, so Dr. Timmons, um, I, I just got to you know, give a shout out. Everybody that's in recirculating aquaculture mm -hmm. knows Dr. Timmons, right? Yeah. He's written the, the yellow, we call it the yellow book, right? Which every, every edition keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, but. To me, I don't know how many editions ago it was, but he added Chapter 19, which is aquaponics. Right? Yeah. And that was done by James Rakosi, right? Rikosi, yeah. yeah. Who, who I've met and, and works a lot with my partner down in New Mexico with Damon C. Right. Yeah. But that book, I mean, is, is like it's, it's our it's, it's the our, Bible. It's, it's our the, Bible. The, the fish yeah, farming Bible. For recirculation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember just a short story that I was at a aquaculture engineering uh, meeting in the U.S. there years ago. And... And when Dr. Timmons first put out his book, and before that, there was another aquaculture engineering book written by Dr. F Fred Wheaton, I think it's, mm -hmm. yeah. And he was giving a talk, and he was introducing this new book, and he took his old book, and he threw it in the garbage, right? And he said, you know, not, I mean, his, his book is still, like, engineering, it's good, right? Yeah. But he said, this is the new the new one, right? So, and it's, and Dr. Timmons and, and the the other people that contribute to it, they, they keep Add, add in, you know, new additions every year or two, right? So yeah. it's, it's very up-to-date, right? So, yeah. But if I, if I go into someone's facility and they don't have that book, 
I know they're in trouble. That's the first problem. <laughs> right. Yeah. Where's your yellow book? Where's, where's your, your yellow where's book? Where's your fish farming book? So that's what so, I do. If I go there yeah. and, they, and they don't have it, the next trip I go, I make sure I get one. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I get one. I you know I make sure they got it right. You know. So so what so so let's let's uh, let's kind of close out on this. Uh, what you know? What do you love most about it? You know what 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 do you love most about it? And and what do you you know, about fish farming or just or about your career or, or, you know, what gets you out of bed every morning and, and what, what are your, what's your vision of the future of fish farming or what do you hope for is, is the wow. future of fish farming? Wow. Well, I'm, I'm on my, I'm on the, we'll call it like, I just turned 63. So I'm on the down, the downside, but I've got a few friends that, that, you know, I'll drop a few names, you know, John Holder and Dr. Yeah. and Brad Hicks and yeah. some guys that are, you know, few, maybe four or five years older than me. And they're still like, like this, right? Yeah. And we're, you know, that's the kind of industry it is that, you know, like, even though we've been at it this long, and I never get tired of it, right? And, <laughs> you don't and, look 63, full no, disclosure yeah, yeah, Gary. Yeah, like, yeah. you look well, like... <laughs> fish farming, fish farming, right? But you know, Fish but, farming keeps you young. See, yeah. everybody will become fish yeah. farmers once that's they right. find that out. <laughs> but to me, you know, you're talking about being early. I remember there's a fellow that used to be involved in the big uh, tilapia farm in, uh, outside of Cornell. And he said, you know, your problem was you were like 20 years early with your tilapia, right? Like you're yeah. way ahead of it. But I'm glad we did it because if we didn't do it, like, you know, those those stocks might, you know, I don't know if people can go and do what we did back there again. I yeah. don't know. You know, it's like, you know, things have changed over there, right? Yeah. So, so you know, to me, the, the the two things, I mean, I, I'm still so pumped about the, the fish we have mm -hmm. down in New Mexico. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we know we got something. Almost every producer that buys fingerlings in Canada and North America, yeah. they come from Americulture, a lot of them, from yeah. the farm in New Mexico. And yeah. the fish that he's producing now, the fingerlings, are are 75% my genetics now, right, yeah. from the Lake Nazar, right? And, you know, shout out to Damon. He does a great job. Mm -hmm. He runs a great facility, produces quarter million to 300,000 fingerlings a week that, you know, every Tuesday night they go out everywhere, wow. right, you know, yeah. to, to Edmonton, yeah. you know, to Calgary, to B.C., to... Ontario and then everywhere in the U.S. Yeah, all right? over North America. Yeah, so you know, and I, and I go down there about every two months. I go down and and I'll, I love helping them out on that night. So I really still get so pumped about working with the fish. Right, mm -hmm. I, I do. I will never get tired of feeding fish, collecting eggs. You know, uh, everything about it. Right. Yeah. But I love putting little notes to the guys on the styrofoam boxes. That I send them out like you know, hey yeah. Tanner, you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, and the next day they phone me and they've got you know the fisher, you know. In, in Edmonton, right? Yeah. You know? um, yeah. But the thing that, that is driving me now is being involved in taking some, say, older farms that uh, used, uh, like, flow-through technology or whatever, right, and, and taking a look at them and, and retrofit them and implementing new technology yeah. to make, make them recirc a recirculating yeah, system. Apl right? Applying yeah. the latest innovation yeah. back into the old yeah. versions so of that's, the farm. Yeah, yeah, so that's one thing. And the other thing is to be involved in, in new projects because yep. I, I, I get a real high out of building these systems, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, yep. you know, the one I, you know, in Ontario. Yeah, we'll definitely get a high out of building Stuart Farms. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, <laughs> pun yeah. intended. Yeah, it'll, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be different from the, the 70s when I was at, well, yeah. Will yeah. it be different, Gary? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. That's about, that's about how long it's been for, yeah, that was it. But, um, you know, with, with uh, the new systems, um, you know, I'm really excited that, that we're talking the scale we're talking about and yeah. not uh, like, you know, a 10-ton farm or yeah, something, yeah. you know, yeah. in aquaculture. I mean, I want to see these bigger farms developed, right? Um, so, you know, I, that's my thing is I, I, I'm always working with, I think, the world, I think the world leaders in, in recirculation, mm -hmm. like with my partner, fellow I work with, you know, John Holder mm -hmm. in, out on Vancouver Island who, who's just developed some, some really cool systems with yeah. with working with him and dr timmons have a partnership right yeah. so you know there's there's this all this collaboration going on it's a very open you know uh just dialogue between all the guys right mm -hmm. um i i don't know if i will be still involved by the time we're standardized but it's going to come right yeah, yeah and there's yeah. going to be big big farms there's no doubt right there's yeah. going to be you know and they're going to be like and i think you know something that really i get excited about is food security for for uh, northern communities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, like, 
it's it's a it's a no brainer to to do something right. Yep. And uh, you know, I've, there's already two or three small projects in Quebec and Ontario, and we're going to do some up north. You know, yep. that, yeah. That, Shout out to Nutroponics yeah. and Sunny Gray and the team. You know, that are going to be carrying the torch up in the Yukon, right? Yeah. For, with a food secure project you're involved in. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's yeah. got to happen. And it should happen, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and uh, you know, obviously we, we probably won't grow tilapia there, but we yeah. could. I mean, they could eat them. There's nothing wrong. I mean, yeah. you just got to convince them that it's all market driven, right? You know, right. that's that's kind of how you need to choose your yeah. fish for yeah. the area. You know, yeah. is there a market for tilapia, or do yeah. we need to do a salmonoid or, or whatever? Or, or if you just growing it for local consumption, there's yeah. nothing wrong with it. It's a good, yeah. it's a great fish, right? Yeah. So I mean, I don't know. So I mean. There's a lot of things that keep me excited, Tanner, you know, <laughs> uh, but meeting you a few years ago and, and taking the walk through that building the initial time, yeah, yeah. you know, and I could just visualize, you know, that, you know, there's the fish over here and, yeah. and all this, whatever, you know, and, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be exciting to get that, act, to get that going, right? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm excited yeah. and that's, and that's happening right away. So, yeah. so we're finally going to be fi- finally putting some hammers and nails in, in some walls here uh, uh, in the next month or so. So, and I love, and I love, and I got to say, I, 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 I love, I love, new, I love province in new brunswick yeah right? yeah that's yeah. one of my favorite provinces for sure. <laughs> okay. all right gary well hey, all right. thank you so much i hey, appreciate it's been great. it and right. uh yeah pleasure as always i'll, I'll hey. uh you know talk to you tomorrow all right thanks <laughs> thanks <Dan>. okay <laughs> see you buddy